boom. Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world. Are you ready for the 200 miles per hour kind of energy that we're gonna bring to this panel today? Well, in case you're here, brand new watching and tuning in, I would like to say welcome to We Do Virtual Events Live. And if you're wondering what the show is all about, it is a talk show featuring trailblazing conversations with global virtual event pathfinders who reimagine the traditional event experience. Boom. That said, I'm kind of interested to see who's here in the house. So if you're here live with us, or if you're actually watching this on social media, or you're actually, you know, watching on our live station crowdcast, say hello. Uh, I want to say a quick hello to those in the live stage, Rohit, Matt, Christina, Kurt, Maya, uh, Ma if I did not butcher that name, Maida, uh, and Super Purposes. Welcome, welcome, y'all. Ch share this out. This is going to be a great panel, and this is a panel, an education panel, and we're going to have a conversation about virtual educational events and environments that keep the students engaged. All right, before we get started, I'm going to give you a sneak peek of who our panelists are, and we'll be right back. Boom. And then, are you ready? I'm bringing up all of my get five guest speakers because I'm not going to waste time. We have a lot to talk about, folks. And this is the show for all you, you know, teachers, educators, school leaders. Um, this is a topic that I think uh, is kind of like I'm passionate about it, too, because it's all about virtual learning, virtual learning environments. So today's topic, virtual educational events and environments that keep the students engaged. Make sure you comment and ask questions and engage with one other, another and say hello and network. And are you ready? I'm bringing up all six of them right now. Boom. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. <laughs> she, she's suddenly like, oh, 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 I'm on screen. <laughs> Ta -da. Welcome, welcome, everyone. How is everybody doing this morning, this afternoon? Well, actually, it's morning for all of us, right? Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Pretty Thank morning. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. All right, I'm kind of excited to get us started, but before we do, let's go around the room. 30 seconds, a quick intro. I know I did play your, you know, sneak peek, but please, it'll be nice to hear from your own words. All right, let's get Robert, get us started here. Hi, everybody. Robert Bronte from the Career Service Station. I'm also a college professor online and in person in uh, six different states. Boom. SJ. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Super Julie Braun, and I'm the founder and CEO of Super Purposes. And what we do is we help people get the salary that they deserve. Boom. Shannon. Good morning, everybody. I'm Shannon Lockwood. I'm the Events and Programs Manager for NIGP, which is a nonprofit association serving public procurement. Boom. Aaron. Hi, everybody. I am Aaron Smith. I'm a program administrator at Denby Aviation Academy, and I love talking with people about how to keep kids engaged. Boom, and Jay Michael, the funny one. <laughs> oh yeah, Is that, well, I, don't, I wanna be the super one. I'm gonna have to figure out how to get my name changed to Super Jay Michael Hall. Uh, Jay Michael is the fancy name. My name is Mike Hall. I'm the president and founder of Strong Fathers, Strong Families. We work with dads and kids in schools and early childhood environments, and of course, had to go virtual a couple about a year and a half ago now and um and so we're doing that both in person this coming school year and we've been doing training and working with dads and kids all over the country all over the world uh virtually for the last 14 to 16 months so we're glad to be here Awesome. I'm so excited to have everyone here. So we're going to kind of get started. But before that, I want to do a quick shout out. Hi, Amy Mills. Welcome to the broadcast. Welcome to the show. She's another arts teacher in North Carolina. And, you know, she's been in my circle doing a lot of virtual stuff, too. So welcome. Welcome to the show. And I see Rohit is saying, uh, I can't put your, uh, you know, your uh, message or comment on screen because you're in a different stage. But I just want to acknowledge, hi, Rohit is from India. And then we have Kurt from 
Sprout Hood, Texas. Oh, Texas in the house oh. with you. There we go. Uh, Mike. Matt Wolf is North Carolina and Jacqueline from Palm City, Florida. Whoop, whoop. All right, everybody, let's get this conversation started, right? So today we're going to talk about virtual educational events and environments that keep the students engaged. And I want to get started with this question. So question one and how this will play around, folks, is just that, you know, we're going to have two questions in the first half of our segment. We'll have a lot of fun, a lot of ha-has, and you know, feel free to drop your comments because we love to see your comments on the screen. And um, we're just gonna take turns around the room about three minutes to answer the questions one and questions two. And then in segment two, we will actually have fun. And I'll be like Vanna White for 30 minutes, you know, just doing the Wheel of Fortune kind of thing, you know? But um, here's question one, folks. So, um, the question one we would like to know is how are you using virtual programs to motivate students, staff team members, educators, and school leaders? Maybe you can share one element in what you're doing. Jay Michael, would you like to start uh, get us started? Yeah, absolutely. And so when, when everything hit in March, um, a couple of things happened. We were actually supposed to be in Singapore at the end of that month. Of course, they had the circuit breaker prior to that. So we didn't get to make that trip, but we were starting to look at how do we do that? We use Zoom. Uh, we use Zoom for most of our staff training. And so what we had to do is, OK, so we have an engaging person in person training with all these bells and whistles and things. And now we've got to change things up. What are we going to do? So we went to looking for platforms and tricks and, and you know, learned the hard way. Uh, I'm actually do after this, I'm doing another training for a Head Start Association on the West Coast. They were the first ones that said, would you do a webinar? And I'm like, yes, I'll do anything right now. I'm, I'm at home. I don't have any work. I'm trying to figure this out. So we did that webinar and started using those tools just to get the webinar done and, and kind of figured out what people were looking for. And so I'll just change this real quick. So just think about a staff training. Um, I've done Zoom for a long time into meetings. And then when you're in a meeting and there's you're up on the screen, it's just my big head. And it's like, nobody just wants to see the big head up there, but we need to emote. And so uh, what we've got here is just, you know, side-by-side -side slides uh, so that I can emote because I make a lot of bad jokes and I need them to know I know the jokes are bad, <laughs> those kind of things. Um, we do, I think you can see this. So I have an overhead camera That's here because we do child, dad and kid activities. So we can do Love split it. screen, overhead camera. And, and I've got a setup, but the setup I started with was very simple. It was an iPod on a bookshelf, right? And so there's all kinds of ways to do this. So when you see this, um, now the other thing is we do card games. And so if you're trying to get the attention of a five-year-old and a dad, which is worse than a five-year-old, uh, <laughs> so and so, you know, you can come in and out of the card and uh, even if, I mean, the content's going to work for them, right? We try to provide very engaging content, but we do try to use some tricks and things. But I've been in good staff presentations, hopefully given them. I've been in bad ones. So we try to not only avoid that, but it's like, what makes this? I, I tell you what was crazy when COVID hit was watching TV news stations that have all these resources do really poor um, broadcast from their own home. I'm like, you have all the equipment. And so people in this community, the Zeph that you and I know, people all over the all over the world that are making this happen, they're using really simple tools, but those tools help you make it. You've got to have engaging content. We know that. Yes. But um, because everybody's having to look at a screen, small or large, uh, you got to use a, full, a few things here to make that work. And so uh, the tools are simple, uh, but I think we've got to access that and then think about timing. Like I won't do a six hour training online. I'll do a couple of three hours, three, two hours. But I, uh, some of us have been in those six hour trainings and they're just a beating. And so we take that. We have some live. We have some pre-recorded for folks. And so we try to use those tools uh, to keep dads engaged, kids engaged. And then staff is actually our hardest group because they're made to be there. Right. They didn't select to come in. And so I do a lot of questions, not just on chat, but I ask them to raise their hand. I have a video set up where I can see up to 200 people on Zoom. Um so I can watch the whole staff and kind of see my energy. How's it working? Is everybody checked out? Uh, we make them keep their camera on, which makes me seem like I'm a recovering middle school principal. And so people kind of like, man, he's kind of kind of that way sometimes, right? It's like, no, guys, you need to turn your camera on because, you know, somebody paid us to be there. 
and we want to make sure that um, our content is good enough. My job is to make you not want to turn your camera off. My job is to make you yep. want to be there. Even though you planned on doing Facebook or Sudoku or whatever you're going to do, I'm going to make sure you don't get to it. That's my job is to be engaging enough. Um, and sometimes you have in a long training, you got to have a few bells and whistles, no matter how good your content is. So that's what Absolutely. we've been doing. Uh, dads and kids. Um, I've got some stuff I'll show you later. If we get to it, Love we it. do dance ins and dance outs um, to keep people engaged. So, yeah. I can, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you can, you can get pretty fancy pretty quick. So, yep. um, yeah. So if we need to just go out, let me know. I've got this stuff. So we'll do that. And I think at the end of the day, it's not about just being fancy. It's not about being fancy, but really right. about being creative, right? About the content that we're delivering. Because now we're not in person. We have to figure out ways that can get the audiences, the students to keep engaging with us. And uh, can anyone relate to this? Who wants to go next? Okay, I have silence. I'll pull out names. Super Julie. <laughs> what's oh your my take goodness. on what was just shared? Yeah. Well, um, you know, Zeph, I think I think we should show everybody exactly <laughs> what we want students to do, like when they're yep. fully engaged. Yes. And when they're super excited and they're integrated into their environment. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, so right now, you know, I think I'm, I, I'm thinking, I love Shirley and cotton balls and shall it looks I like put you, it up and show yeah. our audiences what this means. Ready? Are y'all uh, ready to see Shirley on the, uh, all the curls and the cotton balls? Here's what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Shirley Lambert. Cotton balls, you know, you want, and and this is a way to engage your your, your audiences by putting up a, a, a fun kind of video clip and, you know, talk about, okay, everybody, let's all get together. Let's all move forward. Let's all, uh, you know, get it done. And, you know, the thing that, that we do a lot of is we have our teammates do demonstrations. So instead of me telling everybody or me showing everybody how to do something or even our leads or seniors, we ask every single person, you know, we give them an opportunity to train us. So turn on your screen, share your screen. Let's see what you're doing. OK. And 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 if there's confusion, that's an opportunity for us to, you know, kind of tweak things and say, OK, now can you go over there and can you click on that and and having them do it makes everybody kind of like, Oh no, I hope I don't get called next. Like how many people yep. worry about that? Like, Oh, I hope I'm, I'm not cut off guard. <laughs> right here. Sometimes like, please don't look at my screen. Don't, don't, don't look at me. Don't look right. at me. Right. Yeah. I still get it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's a key component to having a really successful like what michael is doing like mike what i love what you're doing because i think it's kind of you know it's very inventive and fun and i kind of want to come to a class that you're conducting <laughs> yeah exactly um yeah so you know i think that that's the factor and uh like mike had said previously you know we can't really like go up to to somebody and you know kind of get in their face and you know kind of say hey are you are, are you with me here so uh i i think that's that's our hot tip yeah yep. boom robert would you like to add to this and um answer the question yes uh you know from my end uh, I'll, I'll talk about it uh, a little bit from the student and the team perspective so as a professor uh, I teach a lot of entrepreneurship classes, and we were running into uh, pre-COVID, uh, not a lot of people uh, you know, giving the students feedback. And what Zoom has really enabled us to do is we don't run really long events. The events tend to be about uh, 25 minutes, and we're able to get students' feedback earlier on because you know everybody seems to have a 25-minute window where they can provide some feedback, and the students love it because... They can talk about their idea in its infancy, you know, spend a minute each uh, doing a presentation and then, uh, you know, getting some feedback for a three to five minutes each, uh, which works out uh, very well. 
And as well with the students, uh, I found their presentation skills have gotten better by kind of taking the pressure of having to move their slides to the next slide. I handle that for them and they can just get on here and, and, and do a really great uh, informative presentation. And then teams wise, I kind of take that same model of 25 minutes and uh, give give my team four opportunities throughout the week to, to attend a meeting. And they're very interactive and fast paced. Uh, first segment is kind of a round robin. Let's go and let's have a conversation. We do some short breakout rooms. And I wasn't really sure how that would work out for our teams, but they love it because then, you know, five to 10 minutes, I'll give them a discussion point or some some kind of fun exercise to do, and then they'll come back and do a share. So that 25 minute period goes by pretty well. So at the beginning, we didn't know how the students or teams would react, but uh, all these virtual platforms have made it very easy uh, to keep those conversations going. Love it. Because, and I think another component of this, what you just said, is that the technology aspect of this, right? Because we have the technology tools. I think that was a learning uh, curve for teachers, educators, and even school leaders who are trying to figure out how do we leverage these tools to deliver what we need to do yep. when it comes to, you know, virtual learning. Uh, folks, just a quick shout out before, you know, uh, we move on. I just want to say a quick hello to Dee Boone, who's just in the house joining us. Leland Bass is in the house. Welcome, everyone. Um, in case you're just tuning in, we are um, the panel for education for We Do Virtual Events live show. This is episode nine, and today's conversation is focusing on virtual educational events and environments that keep the students engaged. And we've seen some great examples from, uh, you know, and points from, um, you know, Robert, SJ, and SJ goes like 25 minutes. <laughs> She's my cue card girl today. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. You know that, right? So we love this. Like, oh, you're muted. <laughs> Anyways, um, Shannon, would you like to share your take on things? I would love to. And I actually think I have uh, building blocks off of what SJ said and what Robert said, because um, I actually attended one of those terrible six to eight hour all day classes <laughs> very recently. Um, and we have lots of adult learners, right? My association serves professionals. So we have all day classes that we offer sometimes two, three days in a row where we're expecting them to really engage and stay focused with us, delivering almost exactly how we would have in person. Uh, and one of these tips that I really loved for how we keep folks engaged happened to me in attending this course. And the instructor at the very beginning, right before everybody fell asleep, was uh, po posted a slide that said, here are the time breakdowns of this course. There's five time blocks over the course of an hour. You, here's the 20 people who are uh, attending today. And here is the time where I'm going to expect that you as an adult learner are going to pay attention and be called upon potentially at random within this one hour time block. And so if you, for whatever reason, needed to step away or needed a minute to eat your lunch or drink your coffee, you wouldn't do that during the one hour time slot where you knew you could be called on. And I thought that that was such a unique way to give them, um, you know, one thing we know about adult learners is that they don't like to be called out. They don't like to be embarrassed. So we want to make sure that if they're going to get called out, they know what time it's going to happen. Okay. And I thought that was okay. such a unique opportunity and something that could transfer down even to um, college students or high school students, right? You give them a time where they're going to be expected to pay attention and, and that can increase the level of engagement. Um, and the other thing, just building off of the breakout room conversation um, that Robert mentioned, um, NIGP has been doing virtual events since 2018. So we have been doing educational content delivery. And one of the things that we found that our members were missing throughout the pandemic was really the opportunity to get together and have sort of a vent uh, to talk to other folks who were struggling in these emergency operation command centers, buying PPE, doing all of the emergency procurements for vaccines. Um, and they really just didn't have an outlet. And one of the things that we expanded our range, if you will, in part of our virtual events was to do networking sessions with breakout rooms. And one of the things that we tried is actually sort of a speed networking, right? Where you would create a breakout room randomly dump folks into it 
and say, talk about this topic. What's the most interesting thing you had to buy during the pandemic? What's the, um, you know, what was the fastest turnaround time? Coming up with fun questions that could be answered quickly by a, you know, a small to medium sized group and get them meeting and talking to new people. So I um, really love that uh, this stuff sort of scales up and down the spectrum of education um, because it it does really work for for all ages as long as you're keeping it to short amounts of time and um, keeping the content very interesting for sure. Thank you for sharing that. First yep. of all, I want to say, right, uh, I kind of relate to what you just shared. I just thought like, you know, SJ and I always talk about this uh, because SJ, do you remember we used to say, we got to let them know this is what you need to do now and then you need to do next and the next five minutes. And I think creating those expectations so there's no surprises and people are clear about it. And that's why we noticed in the beginning of the show, I try to do this often, but, you know, sometimes not too often just because I forget to, but I try to get, people to understand what's going to happen during the show like hey the first 30 minutes this is what we're going to do you know in the next mm -hmm. 30 minutes we're going to have a little bit more fun so i think that creates some sort of like understanding and clarity about what they're about to watch and we only have you know people now have seven to ten seconds attention span right yep. and you kind of like to keep it moving move 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 yeah. and uh what else if students they're like oh what was that sj like this <laughs> totally. I just had to borrow this. That I just is had to borrow this. Every this that, this guy is every presentation that I've seen that has text all over it. You know, yeah, that's nice. that's me. I mean, or the kid that grabs a screen grab of himself like writing notes and just uses <laughs> that as his visual and right. walks away. You're Which like is, <laughs> But that's genius. I it's I so genius. It's so right. genius. I right. I was doing training with 15 to 20, you know, trying to keep it to a small training because it was half a day or and then one of them was almost all day. And we're like, OK, we we're going to talk. And that way we get to talk a lot more. But I had guys that they would have their camera off. And I'm like, so I'm asking, you know, just like you would do in a regular classroom. I'm a former teacher, recovering middle school principal. Um, and and I would say, hey, just turn your camera on for a minute. The guys in Walmart. Somebody's paid for him to be at this training and he's walking around. Now he's listening because he turns it on. So I don't know if you guys know John Berghoff with Exchange. Um, I absolutely stole their template because they have an understanding when you sign in for the training. Here's what we expect from you. Mm -hmm. And I do that not only because that's just people that walk around with their even with their laptop. Oh, my gosh. Just I'm going to get motion sick. Um, but just standard understanding from our students also of we want you to be engaged. We're going to give our time to you. We expect you to give our time to us. It is our job. I do think it's our responsibility. Zeph, like you said, yep. we've got to provide content that matters. We no do. matter how fancy it is. But we, we ask them to do that too. So. Mike, I, I, I got to jump in with one comment. And that is when I see people driving oh. and they're in a uh. meeting, Right. You know, uh, and they ha and, and they have their ca and, and maybe they'll push the camera. And I'm like, uh, uh, okay, no. uh, you don't have to be here. You really don't. <laughs> you don't have to be here. Exactly. I don't think we have workman's comp for what right. you're doing right now. I yeah. think it's just cre creating yeah. the awareness. Um, Aaron, I know you have something to share. I'm gonna let you share. I that. do, and and I I agree with everybody here because there are some incredible things going on, but. To me, when I first think of COVID and the crisis that we have been in, it's like the elementary school teacher rolling in the cart, having the VCR and the big old TV honked on the top of it because it is nothing but passive learning. And when you were a student, you just could do this all day long. No, you don't have to do a lick of things. So that's kind of what we have to be careful about is what are we doing to make our students or our audience not only highly engaged, but highly productive as well? You know, that's the secret to it. For some, it could be gamified. For some, it could be non-tech. And how do you get them back together? My wife had a great idea and she had a pet of the week. And it came up because when she was teaching, our crazy dog would sit behind her and he would be right here. So the kids would see his face as she was teaching a lesson. And it was hilarious to the kids. So that became an instant engagement factor. And she built it into the pet of the week or the pet of the day. And nothing as long as snakes were there, it seemed to be fine. Um, but when you think about highly productive and highly engaging things, 
what are we doing to make sure we accomplish both? And, and I bring this up because when you think about being highly engaged, I could be playing Candy Crush while I'm watching and listening to the seminar and be highly engaged in the wrong thing. You have to merge both of them together. And it's a blend of not only knowing the students, knowing your audience, but knowing the right tools for the right moments. You know, that's the secret to it. So whether you're using Jamboards, whether you're using QR codes and having them pull up, you know, a visual on their phone, it's, it's making sure you're finding the right situation for the perfect moment. I love that that you shared that. And I just want to quickly read a comment from uh, Matt. And I think Matt, this uh, he's watching and uh, on our live stage and says, now that is a really amazing implementation in the education world. Definitely a view where one needs to make sure they know what they are going to be going over exactly mm -hmm. in the class. Thank you, Matt, for sharing that with us. And uh, folks, I'm just going to do a quick 10 seconds intermission and we will be right back. And we're back, folks. We are talking about, um, on this educational panel, we're talking about virtual educational events and environments that keep the students engaged. And now I want to go into question two because we had such great points about um, topic number, uh, question number one, which was, you know, how are you using virtual programs to motivate students, staff, team members, educators, or school leaders? Really great shares. And this is question two. Question two is, how do you establish and organize communication plans with students in remote environments? What do teachers, educators, and or school leaders need to know? I think this is important. I think when SJ, you and I started, well, when I started working in the remote world, you kind of taught me a lot about, you know, establishing a communication plan. How are you guys doing this? Um, would you like to get us started, SJ? <laughs> sure. So I think uh, one of the things, I mean, we've been doing virtual for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, actually, superinterns.com for 14 years. And at Super Purposes, we've been in existence for three years. So it's always been virtual. Um, but simple things like having an agenda for every meeting. Uh, you know, I loved Matt's comment. Um, Matt is actually on our team at Super Purposes. So I'm so glad that you made it, Matt. Thank you so much for coming. Um, but I mean, that's the kind of engagement that we get in a lot of our meetings. And I think, you know, we take polls just yesterday, our HR team did something really cool. They had lined up all these polls and they did a PowerPoint presentation. They showed everybody some questions and then they had everybody vote on them during the meeting. And I watched the recording of the meeting and it was awesome. People were engaged. They were, you know, voting. They, they felt like they were part of it. And I think that's what we look for um, in establishing some of those tools and some of those ways of uh, always running a meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, I, agree. I love that you mentioned tools because people forget because it's technology. We have access to them, therefore leverage it. It just will take a little bit of a learning curve like anything else, right? From black and white TV to color TV to from right. rotary phone to smartphone, everything has a learning curve. So we yeah. all have to just figure it out if we want to stay with, the, uh, I mean, stay with the uh, current, um, you know, way of doing things, the new normal for many things. Yep. One of the pa my panels, um, in one of the shows, um, Dr. Shitachi, who is in um, North Carolina, and she talked about, she says like, hey, if you don't want to roll with the punches, get ready to get punched. And boom, absolutely right. There you go. All right. Um, J. Michael Hall, would you like to add to that? And yeah, you know, I, how do you establish your complaints? Well, one of them is we, we do you like, so we're in Zoom quite a bit. And, mm -hmm. and I've used other tools. I like Zoom because I have that interaction. But there's some really great tools in Zoom that I don't think we always use correctly. So um, I really like Spotlight. I don't know why we don't Spotlight enough. We, we just let somebody talk. And you've got to find them in the amongst the 20, you know, the 25 or the 49 people. And it's like whoever's running that meet. And I run my own tech. 
Um, and I'm ADD, so it works, you know, like I'm finding them. Um, but spotlighting people, spotlighting multiple people. Uh, so when we say, hey, show us your uh, mousetrap catapult, show, you know, the stuff that we're doing, or, hey, you guys tell me what how you're doing this based on this principle. Um, and then also the chat. The chat is a great tool. Now, here's the thing that I've noticed in some of the other things I've been involved in or that I watch or that I attend is there's some really cool tools out there. But there's a couple of things. There's a threshold for participants. So if you have like like Super Julie, when you were talking about you've got some clients or customers or students, once they if you can take the minute just to show them how to use that tool, then that's a great tool to use all the time. If you're always getting a new audience, sometimes we like the bells and whistles and people are like, I don't I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to, you know. And I think we can still teach and learn that way. But sometimes the tools that are in front of us, even on Zoom. So mm -hmm. real quick, just let me show you an example. Uh, let's see. Let's just do it this way. So let me take, well, falling dice may give somebody a headache. So let me change that real quick. I love um, when he makes his uh, demos because I think folks, for you guys out there who are just trying to find out creative ways, here's yeah. an example. Boom. I love, love yes. the over the head camera. Yeah. And it's yeah. okay. So I've got a setup here. I've got this whole thing that I built, but you can do it. Like I said, you can do it with an iPod and a mic stand or mm -hmm. really one of those long foam arm, phone, not foam arms, you know, number one, phone <laughs> arms. <laughs> um, but I've got a, I've got an old uh, camcorder that I had. I used to do a lot of flip charts and I still I can throw chat up here. I can fit it into the screen. But sometimes it's like and I use I'm sorry about my boy writing is what I say. You know, um, you girls write better than most of us boys. But I like using this because I'm taking their input where I don't have to spotlight them, but I can hear them. We can talk about it. And then we may go back and spotlight somebody and go, you said this. Tell me more about that. But this and then, uh, I mean, we can do this, too. So we use dice games, card games, overhead. Love it. And but this is such a simple setup. I use Ecamm. So that is how you do that. But Just even if you don't. Yep. Yeah. Even if you don't have Ecamm, if you're doing Zoom, your phone, iPhone, your iPod, you can zoom in with that. And that's your camera. And you just spotlight where your camera is. So you don't have to have all these, you know, and Ecamm's not expensive, but you don't have to have all these tools. You can use the one that's provided to you uh, to do some easy things. I always, I like cheap and easy. I've always been cheap and easy, according to some. But um, I think the more we can do, and I like bells and whistles, but sometimes we, we, we keep our students from being engaged because they're worried about how to find the next button, click or link. And those are good tools and I'm good to use it, but sometimes they get in the way. And, and I don't know, everybody's got their own thing, but that's just what I would say. I think at the end of the day, what we're really saying is that, you know, if there is a um, there's really a passion to deliver content that is engaging, we will find a way to, you know, figure it out, whether it's technology or whether we're in person, we always figure it out. It's just going to take a little bit of a learning curve. Yeah, we can keep it as simple. Like for me, uh, and I love that you say you use Ecamm and we're just going to get geeky for two mm -hmm. seconds here. But <laughs> basically, Ecamm is just a production tool for streaming, live streaming. And I'm doing. I'm using another tool. You can keep it really simple or you can take it up a notch. It all depends on your own capacity. That's what I think. Um, but I just want to kind of share uh, some engagement here. I want to say, Caitlin actually said, use group work and collaboration. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, Matt Wolf, I think he says, I got to agree with Aaron. Uh, knowing exactly who your audience is going to be will make such a huge difference from kids petting dogs while the teacher is talking to throwing an engaging reel. I love love that. So thank you guys for engaging with us. And this is uh, what uh, we're talking about today, folks. Um, this panel, education panel, is having a conversation about virtual educational events and environments that keep the students engaged. I'm going to go and get a 20 seconds into mission and we'll be right back and answer this question number two. We'll see you in a few seconds here. If I can find the right one. Explore and discover with us. Why virtual events are becoming more essential to what you do and how you connect with the audience. How to choose the right type of virtual event for you. What kind of tools and resources are needed to produce your virtual event. How to pick the right virtual event service providers. How to monetize and profit from your virtual event. 
For more exclusive content, resources, and opportunities regarding virtual events, join our online community. Boom. All right, we're back. Folks, we're at question two. And question two is how do you establish and organize communication plans with students in remote environments? What do teachers, educators, and or school leaders need to know? Um, Aaron, would you like to share your take on this? Sure. I, you know, I, I agree that you've got to have a, a clear agenda, but I, I want to take it a step before that. You need to look at the three C's. What do you need to need to be clear? How are you going to be concise? And more importantly, how are you going to be consistent in sharing your information? When you put those three C's together, that's when you know what can be sent in an email that everybody should know how to read versus something that needs to be discussed in person. You know, we all are Zoom fatigued, but how can we reduce the Zoom fatigue is by becoming smarter in the way we prepare and especially in the way we deliver. And you think about we're bored, we're tired of Zoom fatigue. Think about how the kids are. And especially if they've got that same teacher every day who is just not maybe as tech savvy or is distracted and not able to really put it together the way they want to do. But when you do collaborate, don't do it in, in a generic way. Do something that's really going to make it exciting. You know, you can go to what is it? My my dot bulb app dot com. Um, and that's another collaborative experience that you can use. Another one that you can do is go to Buncey. And, and I like these because they're colorful, they're inviting, and to me, they're very kid friendly. And, you know, if they say we can't afford this, this, that, and the whole nine yards, remind them of the uh, stimulus act that was a pass for educators and the importance of it because this allows them to branch out into new tools, new resources, and developing things that's really going to take learning and collaboration to the newer level. Love it. And uh, I had some behind the scenes chatter. So I thought I'll just put it up on screen. So as Jay said to Mike, Mike, the thing that you said was amazing. Taking notes and showing them you are paying attention to what they're saying. I love it. See, I always do this too, behind the scenes kind of thing. It's kind of cool. Uh, thank you. Um, Shannon, um, your take on this question. So I love what Aaron said about clear, uh, concise and consistent, you know, communicating with adults who uh, are probably worse at reading email than children. Uh, they tend to have a very short attention span for what we put in an email. And so making sure that, you know, we're building, um, building blocks for them to be able to say, okay, we have a new platform, All right? We have a new platform and we're gonna use this new tool and we have a new tool and we're gonna build this new event. And for us, getting that information out to them in small digestible nuggets is much more effective than trying to send them an instruction sheet with 10 bullet points that no one has uh, ever read all the way to the completion. Uh, the other thing that we like to do, uh, at least in our space, we have a dedicated uh, communities surrounding each of our events that are located on our association's website. So we actually try to drive them to create their own community, um, making it possible for them to ask questions of their fellow attendees rather than getting all of the information from perhaps us or our presenters, uh, giving them opportunities to engage uh, and communicate with one another, problem solving on their own, suggesting topics that we should be adding to the schedule at the last minute um, for some of that crowdsourced uh, type content, we definitely try to encourage them to communicate well in advance of the event, get connected with other folks and build the uh, engagement and enthusiasm for the content and the, the event prior to it even beginning. Um, so I really love what, what everyone said here about, you know, making sure you know your audience. Uh, certainly uh, we know that that arts needs small chunks of digestible information that small will chunks. build them to the whole uh, experience for sure. Thank you, Shannon, for sharing that. It's small chunks, you know, biteable sizes, right? Small nuggets that we all can chew. Um, all right. What time it is, oh, folks? This is. Yay, we get to play the game. So I'm going to put this up on screen since Robert uh, didn't get a chance to do that. But I'm going to get Robert first. How this goes is I'm going to spin the wheel. All right. And we're going to play a game. So Robert is my first pick. Robert will answer this question and then we will spin the, uh, the wheel again and Robert will pick the next person to answer the question. Y'all game? Yes? No? 
Shake your head. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. yes <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm being Let's the teacher today. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh my gosh, the the dog wants to play. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> Boom. All right. So question to you, Robert, is how has your organization used virtual events to provide continuing education of your members outside of traditional virtual event formats? Sure. So uh, one of the things we encourage on our team is uh, for people to create their own little 25 minute talk show. Uh, So most recently, Isabel, who was working with us from China, uh, put together a 25 minute uh, talk on how to use Canva. And she used a lot of screenshots and and firsthand experience. And so it was so nice to to make the student the teacher and and give us uh, all an opportunity to learn from one another. Boom. Thank you for that. And we're going to do the second one. Here we go. Now we're done with this one. Hello. Let's do another one. All right. Who do you want to ask this question to? Robert, if you could read it and then ask the person you want to answer. All right, Shannon, we'll go to you for this one. How has your event strategy evolved over time? And what advice do you have for other associations or educational event planners who may be starting from scratch? Oh, I love this question. I was in the pre-work. I was excited. I was like, okay, I hope I get this one. Uh, so <laughs> my av- advice is, number one, you do not have to be perfect to start. You can absolutely start exactly where you are with the tools that you have to mm-hmm. create something valuable for your members. Um, NIGP in 2018 started with seven sessions that were completely pre-recorded. And now we're three and a half years into this and we are doing over 140 sessions, uh, a combination of pre-recorded and live. So we have um, totally built the blocks from the very bottom all the way up to the top. So you do not have to be perfect to start. You do not have to have all of the bells and whistles as mentioned earlier. Uh, to do something wonderful and your folks just want to hear from you. So start where you are. Thank you for that. Boom. Here's what I've been talking about, you know, and that's a little bit of conversation behind the scenes about pre-recorded content and also the life, because yep. I'm very, the life conversation kind of, kind of gal. That's, that's who I am. And I think uh, J Mike, uh, Michael also actually agrees with that because you do a lot of like broadcast life teaching. So I want to kind of like, just ask quickly before we go to the next game in, in the sense that how have you seen Shannon, like, or anybody else who want to answer this question, the pre-recorded content, how is it creating more engagement versus the live content? Because this is a big conversation because from a production end of things, I'm not a big pre-recorded person um, just because not everyone knows how to deliver it properly. Therefore, it becomes like, no, no, no. It becomes like this, right? Yes. (laughs) I I would say that that's the first. So, (laughs) yeah, that's the first key point know who's going to do it. Make sure you are selecting and weeding out people who cannot deliver to a virtual audience. Some of those people will self-select, right? They'll say, I can't do this. I need somebody to talk to. Um, Others will be like, no problem. I teach to a room full of kids that are doing this all day long. I can handle that. (laughs) And they know whether or not they can. I would also say making sure that those presenters are live to answer questions yes. while that pre-recording is playing right. is right. so critical because if you are able to incorporate, I mean, there's plenty of pre-recorded content that can include polls that are played live. There's plenty of ch- uh, platforms that allow you to chat live. So answering questions is not out of the question. It's just a different format. You're not answering them verbally. You're answering them in chat. And I think um, all of those things are perfectly valid. So knowing your speakers, and using the engagement tools that you have in those pre-recorded platforms can absolutely increase engagement in pre-recorded content. Boom, yeah. I love this. And can I think, Jay you know, Michael Hall share ahead. this too? Yeah, so you've also got to know your audience. So like if I'm doing something completely new or to a new audience, which, you know, I've been in this work, I've been in this work like over 30 years and I do this, <laughs> everybody goes, wow, you're really good. I'm like, I say the same thing all the time. I should be good at this. It's the same, you know, the same area of presentation or whatever. But in so we did some on-demand training. It had to be short bite, so they, they didn't feel like they couldn't get to the end of it. So they stayed engaged, we hope. We could kind of watch that on the metrics. 
the other thing was, I always call it the, I bet you're thinking this, right? And, and so when you'd say that, when I do that live, I'm like, but right now you're thinking this. And they're like, oh, he's the magic. No, I'm not magic. I've done this. This is what I do. There's a reason you had me come. But when we do that in a pre-recorded, it's like a lot of you are thinking this right now. Mm-hmm. So we'll show you. And if you do your stuff enough, then you can kind of, that's preconceived stuff. But have you evaluated your stuff in the mind? You know, have you talked to people? And like I said, we've had that experience in person. And so our, our virtual, but small bites. And then Shannon, I think you make a great point too, of when I did the recording, I did it like I was live. I had to think I had somebody in front of me because if not, we lose our energy, right? Or we, you've seen this. Thank you for joining us today. I'm not reading anything. Like, oh my yeah. gosh, just talk. And I know I'm not, a, not a talker. Don't talk. But totally. Like, Thanks for joining us today. Uh, welcome <laughs> to, uh, and I'm like, hey. That's how we looked want, in 2018. We've all started. <laughs> 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 Yep. Aaron, your take on this, because I think this is a great conversation to just go around, right? Pre-recorded content, yep. live content. Yep. What's your take on this, Aaron? Well, you also have to think about the capacity of the learner. And, and from a technical perspective, learning on a laptop is going to be completely different than learning on your phone. So if I'm learning on my phone, I cannot read the handouts while I'm reading or watching the video. I mean, talk about the eyes going in different directions. You you know, you just feel like you're having a knee jerk reaction. So in addition to that, when you do have to have handouts, make sure that it is such an easy to read format because, you know, people have different disabilities. For example, they may be dyslexic and there has to be spacing to include that. You need to have it somewhat enlightening so that when they look at it, they're not like, OMG, you know, (laughs) emojis would be great to add in there too, because it shows the humanistic side of us, because we know that sometimes we get mad and we think the little mad emoji and, and just putting it on there is, with a screenshot and a simple direction makes them be more invited to, to try it. Robert, your take. I think a good mix of uh, live and recorded is good uh, because uh, sometimes uh, the recorded content has a shelf life. You know, you may have something that you think is a current event and the next yep. thing you know, the, the whole world has changed. So, uh, and I really find uh, the students love the live stuff, uh, especially if you make it interactive. Um, so, so I think, uh, if you are going to record, uh, I had a, an old friend, William Williams. Yes, that was his name. Uh, poor, poor guy, um, uh, who would record a 70 minute lecture of just droning on as Michael mentioned, and it just didn't work, it, you know, digestible chunks as, as several of us have mentioned today. Yeah. Love it. Um, here's one thing um, just came to mind from last week's panel. Last week, we had a panel um, of, um, you know, folks, content creators doing, virtu- you know, different content creation of virtual it, through virtual events. One of the big uh, key takeaways from this conversation that applies to our conversation right now was this, is this, the recording versus the live component. She said she did a virtual summit. It was a, during a live session where there was a one of the attendees had a meltdown and she had the opportunity, had it just be, been a recording, uh, recorded video on demand, you know, the audiences would not have experienced her coaching or that live moment. What happened was during that moment, she was able to talk uh, this attendee from meltdown to who I'm, I'm going to be able to do this. So that live component, that's why I'm a lot about pro life conversations because I never know when I'm masterminding like this and aha moment pops up. I'm like, Oh my God. So true. You know, you just saved me six months of doing some grind work. Mm -hmm. So that just, you know, that, that's why I'm all pro-life because of like, I never know who needs to take a look at the content that we just shared in this live session. Mm-hmm. SJ, back to you before we go to um, the next uh, game. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that's, I mean, super smart people in this room. So, oh, I guess I'm the only one in this room, but super <laughs> smart people on my monitor, okay? Um, Well, the thing that's really hitting me, Zeph, is I think use the live and use the recording for those moments, you know, and and bring that in 
to yeah and mike you're not the only one that does bad dad jokes i do <laughs> i'm a tro just, i'm a pro though i'm a pro i'm just saying. well you know that's how i generally get paid okay so <laughs> so i'm you know i could arm wrestle you over that one but I, I think when you do the live event and you have the moment, take the clip of that moment and then use it in your next live moment. Yeah. And I think that that is a way that we keep content, you know, shifting and integrating and um, anyway, but that's all I have to say. I want to put something up here on screen because I'm kind of copying and paste from um, the live stages. So here's what Christina said. Christina saying, um, if I can find her comment right here, she said, recordings are great. Um, uh, recordings are so great, especially for taking notes. Yes. And Matt says right here, I have a friend who during his class, he would put a tape recorder of the class so he could re-listen to the teacher's lecture. He always said that it helped him reaffirm the information. Love it. So this is what we're talking about, folks. Um, and let's do one more last spin the wheel. And who was it? Did we get? Uh, I was first. Oh, yay. Me. I forget. Help me here. All right, here we go. So we're going to do this. And you get to pick the person you want to answer this question. Ah. I like this. What type yeah. of virtual education events do you organize? And how are they optimized to meet your goals? Uh, SJ, let's start with you. Yay. Oh, my goodness. I'm totally shaking my head no, because I didn't. <laughs> she called you out. <laughs> I know. And I'm like, now what's the question again? One yeah, more time. I, 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 what type of virtual events do you organize and how are they optimized to meet your goals? Okay. So what type of virtual event? Well, I mean, we do a lot of big topics like how to negotiate and make five to $10,000 more a year. I mean, who doesn't want to come to that? Right. I bet all of you are, might be thinking, okay, I want to sign up for that one. Um, so we do kind of big topics and our virtual events are generally to people who are struggling in their careers. Like they may have a job that they don't love, so they've lost their passion. Or maybe they're right out of school and they're saying to themselves, oh my gosh, no one's ever going to hire me because I've spent all of my time in class and I have zero experience. So people in different aspects of their career. That's what we use for virtual events. And um, there's all these different platforms. I mean, I love what Zeph does here. Um, so Zeph, if I can just give everyone a little insight, StreamYard is how you kind of get all of us organized. But the actual tool that you use is Crowdcast. And I love Crowdcast. Mm -hmm. I just think it's amazing. You get comments, questions, polls. There's a way to direct people to the next thing that you're doing. So anyway, that's my answer. And I think, uh, thank you for that, SJ. And let me just do a quick shout out because I see a few new faces here. Um, Edward's in the house. Janice Drew Bennett. Janice is one of our uh, presenters or guest speakers on um August, the last show, which is August 25th. And um, this will be interesting conversation. Christina Jones, Jules Miller, just join us on the live stage. Hello, hello, y'all. Welcome, welcome. So um, I think one of the big things we talk about whenever people says, what type of virtual educational events? Sometimes people, there's so many formats. People are just like, uh, I don't know mm -hmm. which one to do. For me, I've been a live video or live broadcast kind of person just because I like the conversational aspect, right? Because it can be turned into do some sort of mastermind uh, brainstorming session or I get live conversations and sometimes it's a webinar for some people for me I don't know I may be wrong uh, I think also comes to the content delivery and how you present it when a webinar these days can be a hit and miss because again we have to seven to se 10 seconds attention span right so webinar can make us go like this right let me put it up again just in case you all forgot what it feels like to be on a virtual event right <laughs> So we don't want that. So if it's a webinar, that's a preconceived notion about how webinars, you know. The, the, it was the funniest call. the third time. <laughs> it really, yeah, exactly. like, ooh, that was good. 
It was sticking was everybody's spine right now. And everybody's going to go to J. Michael Hall. And you're like, how do you do it, buddy? And, you know, it's <laughs> just a great way to share this. But um, before we go, um, I just want to go around the room and ask everyone here, what's your take on the future of, you know, virtual educational environments uh, whether they're in person, uh, virtual, or primarily hybrid. Hybrid could be like Jim Michael Hall could be at a, a you know like a school and doing an activity, and he can do what he does and still bring the in person and virtual element together. But where do you think this culture of virtual educational environments will be heading? Um, Jim Michael Hall, do you want to get us started here? Yeah. So last year we actually did where we were doing everything virtual. We actually did three in-person events that we streamed out from the school. So I had to load my whole. Now, my video rig is on a adjustable height rolling desk. So everything, lights, cameras, everything's a part of it. I had to take part of it down to load in my van. But um, we had six, you know, we were small schools, but we had six to eight families that couldn't be there. So we did those things where, you know, we could be on camera. But I was back here talking to my crowd and then I was also on camera or I would do the live and check back and forth because we're doing the families are doing their activities on the future of that. I think um, training, I think, is people right now just want to get together. And yet there's so many limitations right now. I have a because I'm working in certain states, we have to do virtual. Uh, I had one virtual planned. I'm going to it. I'm going to fly up and do the in-person. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot of value. I don't think virtual is going away. Even if we could all get together tomorrow, the value of it, the things we've learned during this time, the new platforms and the new uses of that. Uh, I do like hybrid. Hybrid right now is taking a lot of bandwidth and or money because we think it has to be a certain, we go back to bells and whistles. And I think there's a way to make that with good sound, good camera, which is not that expensive, a way to do that. But I think we may be overthinking some of, you know, if it's a high dollar event, it needs to be a high dollar presentation, but for good information that's live, I think there's a couple of things we can do and we're going to find that out. But the future is definitely virtual is not going away. Uh, in person is going to, people, people really want to get together, but I think it's yeah. going to be fun in the next year or two to see what hybrid really looks like. And I think the victor is going to be the one that can make it simple and effective and economical. Um, instead of the one people are going to spend a lot of money that they don't have to spend. And so we're going to see that in the future. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, J. Michael, Aaron. So I, I see it a couple different ways. One is for those that are needing skill development and skill enhancement, I see the scope of instructional design really coming into play in the K-12 mm -hmm. sector. And with that becomes an integrative uh, dimension of AI because through that, then they can, focus on specifically the skills that were never officially mastered and bridge it to the ones that are officially mastered. And I think having that blended in with a teacher who can be there to kind of guide them through that process is, is going to have a profound impact on the ability of them succeeding academically. The other piece to it is I see more virtual reality, augmented reality taking shape at home. You know, Oculus sets anywhere from two to four hundred, five hundred dollars. The price of that is going to go down. And those that are doing workforce development, those that are doing career technical ed aspects of it should be jumping on board with this because this is yeah. the best way to reduce cost and improve efficiency in workforce development. Love it. Thank you so much. And just to kind of add, because you touched it on a little bit, so I thought I'll just add touch uh, a little bit on this topic also. So um, in the first um, show in July, there was a hospitality and tourism panel. We talked about how this industry is so, I mean, these two industries are so challenged with, you know, doing virtual events. And uh, we talked about, you know, the possibility of engaging and leveraging AI, mm -hmm. AR, VR, all that stuff. And if you folks are watching this, tune in into the August 25th show because Janice, I'm going to do a shout out for you, Janice. Janice Drew Bennett, who is with Nextec AR. Nextec AR has a, has, is a virtual event platform that has AI built it into it. So that's going to be interesting to see how this can all, you know, come together. And yes, and I, this is the future of, um, you know, where we're heading with virtual it events. It is very um, cool. Totally. Very yeah, cool. It is yeah. so 
super cool. Um, Shannon. Yeah, I, I just want to add to what Aaron said. I think he's absolutely right because, and I mentioned earlier, NHGP was very lucky that we were on this instructional design, um, you know, on-demand, two-week instructor-led content that allowed our learners to be consuming our content, getting their continuing education hours without having to engage with a live event that maybe they didn't have time for during the workday or um, they didn't have the funding to participate in one of our larger annual conferences. And so those um, instructional design elements that allowed them to uh, produce the content for X amount of dollars and then bring the cost down because we had so much volume of people produce, uh, consuming it, I think that's totally the future. Uh, and as Mike said, definitely not going away, uh, going to remain a, a huge component for associations and, and all folks moving forward. Thanks, um, Shannon. Robert? I think uh, the students uh, and really any any uh, adult population uh, attending events is going to be more cognizant of time. I think you can get so much into a 30-second or three-minute segment or even a, a longer session, a 15-minute segment, that I think the expectations are going to be a lot higher, uh, and uh, but there'll be more value add. Uh, and I think my students have seen it and even some of the events I've been to uh, it's almost like uh, we're, we all have our own television shows now, and uh, it's it's uh, going to be exciting to see how how much of this is still used once everything opens back up. Love it, SJ. <laughs> Your turn. So for me, <laughs> yes, I'm on mute. Um, well, you know, everyone everyone's having kind of sort of the similar ideas, but Shannon was reminding me, I've got my 40, I can't believe it, 40 year high school reunion is in September. And um, I can't go. I, I, I'm not going to be able to make it. And so I want to bring a virtual component to it because I know I'm not the only one that can't make it. And so, you know, I think this melding of people wanting to be live, people, uh, you know, maybe not able to make it. I mean, I think that that really is the future of all of this, that melding of both, you know, in-person, virtual. And Robert, I, I just adore you. I love what you said about everyone's creating their own shows these days. It's true. Everybody can have their own, you know, uh, what is it? 15 seconds, 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> yeah. yep. Love that. Yep. Thank you so much, SJ. And you know what, folks, I'm going to also kind of share a little bit, a few of the comments that I kind of pasted from either behind the scenes or uh, from the stage, uh, from the live stage. Christina, you said the simplicity of it, the savings on gas and resources. Absolutely. <laughs> and SJ, you said this, and I, I just... I just love you for saying this. I uh, love it. Live is going to be both in person and virtual. That is where I think events are going. The combo poo-poo platter. Absolutely. You love poo-poo platter. Who does it, right? All right. That's it, folks. I just want to say thank you to all my guest speakers right here. Let me just change my position up so that we can have this like right that. I want to say thank you to everyone who's here joining us live. And if you're watching a replay, please make sure to share it out and drop your comments because we can still have a conversation with you. And in case if any one of you were watching this and thinking, hey, maybe I would love to meet some of these folks on this panel. Well, folks, save this date, all right? The uh, virtual networking expo that I have, uh, that we have planned for uh, September 1st is going to be uh, on September 1st. You can get all the information at wedovirtualevents.live. What is it about? It's just a networking and educational event for event organizers, business owners, and educators. So if you hope events, organize events. If you're a business owner and if you're an educator, we want you to come and network with us because this is where instead of going to 10 different, uh, you know, events, you basically just come to one, uh, just join one event and you will be able to meet some of these folks on this panel here. All right. I just want to say thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So thank much. you so much wisdom today folks thank you so much all right until next time everybody you have been watching we do virtual events live and that's the website you can visit us at until next time thank you all for being here bye everybody bye bye bye, bye. thanks guys